Well, tomorrow is July 4th, a day on which we, as earthly citizens of this nation, celebrate the blessings of liberty and freedom. So with our cookouts and our fireworks and patriotic songs and sandlot watch parties, we remember the signing of the Declaration of Independence and its famous words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. America has always had a complicated relationship with that paragraph. One thinks of the words of Frederick Douglass in his famous oration on July 5th, 1852. So after commending the Founding Fathers as great men of genius and of bravery, and after acknowledging the 4th of July as a worthy anniversary for a nation to celebrate, Douglas asked his audience this question, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. A hundred years later, that sentiment was echoed by Martin Luther King Jr. in his American Dream speech on July 4th, 1965. There he extolled the amazing universalism of that passage from the Declaration before noting this. Ever since the founding fathers of our nation dreamed this dream, America has been something of a schizophrenic personality. Slavery and segregation, he said, have been strange paradoxes in a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal. And of course, we could say similar things about the fundamental issue of justice and righteousness in our day the denial of the right to life to unborn children. Like Douglas, we might ask, what to the unborn is the 4th of July? Or like King, we might say that legalized abortion is a strange paradox in a nation founded on the principle that the right to life is unalienable. So given that complexity, how should we as Christians celebrate this holiday? Three things. First, be grateful to live in a nation whose founding documents say true things about reality. We are created. We have a creator. He is the source of all of our rights, including the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is a worthy inheritance, and it's good to be grateful for it. Second, be grieved that this nation falls so far short, not only of its own ideals, but of God's laws. So whether we're talking about the murder of unborn children, which is still legal in many states, including this one, or the ungodly celebration of all manner of sexual immorality and insanity, or the pride, envy, and hatred that infect our body politic, or the stubborn refusal to acknowledge God as God and give thanks, it is good to be grieved by the ungodliness of this nation. And then finally, be hopeful about God's mercy and justice for this nation. Don't grow weary in doing good. On on this side of the downfall of Roe versus Wade, let's renew our efforts to advocate for the unborn, to persuade our neighbors that at conception, a new, unique human being is wondrously created by God. 
and that every human being has the right to life and that this right ought to be secured by law. Let's continue the good work of building a culture of life through receiving our own children as blessings in Jesus' name, through encouraging and supporting foster care and adoption in our church, in our community, through funding and volunteering at crisis pregnancy centers, and a myriad of other ways that we can build a culture of life. And let us continue that good work. Here's the thing, in the face of opposition and hostility and slander, and let us face that opposition and hostility and slander with gospel-grounded joy because God is for us. So, Cities Church, this 4th of July, be grateful, be grieved, be hopeful. This reminds us of our need to confess our sins. So pray with me. Our Father in God, we confess that we have unclean lips and we dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. And our lips are unclean because our practice does not match our profession. Our boasted liberty is in reality an unholy license. Our national greatness is swelling vanity. Our shouts of liberty and equality are hollow mockery. Our prayers and hymns with all our religious parade are mere bombast and fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. God, we have demanded our rights and then trampled the rights of the weakest and most vulnerable. We confess, Lord, this is a great evil. And Father, as your people, we too have despised the least of these. We've not always received our own children as the gifts that they are. We've sought our own ease and comfort at the expense of others' good. We've sinned with our bodies and with the bodies of other people. We have been haughty and proud, and there is no health in us. And so forgive us, we pray, in your great mercy. And we know that if we in the church regard sin in our own midst, these prayers will be ineffectual. And so, Lord, we confess our individual sins to you now. Father, your mercy is our only hope. It's the only hope for our nation. It's the only hope for the state. It's the only hope for these cities. It's the only hope for this church. And it's the only hope for every person in this room. And so how good it is that you, Father, are the God of mercies. We plead that mercy now in Jesus' name and ask that you forgive our sins Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Please stand for the assurance of pardon. Church, you have confessed your sins, now hear the good news. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, to all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say in Jesus Christ, Your sins are forgiven.